This podcast is presented to you by Pastor Derek Armstrong and Word of Grace Community Church. For more information, please visit wogcc.com. And the title of my message today is Gospel Glasses. We're going to keep looking through the lens of the gospel to see the value that God has for us. I want to ask you guys a question before we get into this message. Last week I issued a challenge. I wanted you to read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 every morning. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, and we're not handing out door prizes. But I do want to ask you, have you done that? And if you haven't, I would encourage you to go back and do it. And if you have done it, I know that God has been using that to plant the seed of truth in your heart. And I know that the Spirit of God is going to work together with the Word of God to do something powerful in your life and renew your mind and help you to see yourself the way that God sees you. You know, some people, they wear glasses recreationally as a fashion statement. I am not one of those people. I wear them because I need them. And I remember how I came to find out that I actually needed glasses because when I went to school, you had this group of kids that thought it was cool to wear glasses and have braces. I wasn't the kid that wanted those things. But some kids thought that it was really cool to need or want those things. And they wanted that, I guess, because of the attention that it got them. But I didn't, I didn't want to wear glasses. I didn't want braces. I didn't want those things. But uh, I was 15 years old. I took my driver's test. And I passed everything without even studying. Hello. So I thought... This is fine. Everything's going great. And then they said, well, before we give you your learner's permit, you need to take an eye exam. And I said, yeah, no problem. Didn't think I needed glasses, never wanted them. And I stuck my head down in that little thing, and they were asking me to read the lines. I couldn't see them. And they said, well, what about line four? Can you read line four? I can't see line four. What about line three? Can't see line three. What about line two? I kind of made something up. (laughs) hoping that I could stay away from needing glasses because I'm having this kind of uh uh-oh moment of realizing something's wrong that I didn't even realize was wrong. And they said, man, you cannot see. They said, you need to go get glasses. I said, I can see just fine. (laughs) Nope, you can't. I had no idea that I had vision problems because the way that I saw the world was the way I had interpreted the world, the way I thought things were. So my mother took me to one of these like hour you know, glasses places that'll get your glasses ready in like an hour. So we went and picked out these cheap, ugly frames that, oh my gosh, I can't believe we picked these things out. Never owned a pair of glasses in my life. Went and got this cheap pair of ugly frames. They whipped them together in an hour. And I came back looking like Urkel. And I passed. (laughs) I passed my driver's test after I was able to see things. But I remember the first time I put those glasses on. It was a really crazy experience. I'll never forget exactly where I was and what I was looking at when I put those glasses on. I looked up and I saw that the trees had leaves. I was like, where did these things come from? I could see the detail on the trees that I never saw before. I could see the detail in things that were far away that I had never seen before. I didn't know what I was missing. I didn't know how people that had 20-20 vision really saw the world. I thought everyone saw the world the way I did. But when I put those glasses on, everything changed. Now, did the trees change? Did the leaves change? No, not at all. But the way I saw them completely changed. And when I looked at those lenses, I think it's a lot like the way that we see things in our lives and the way we see ourselves and the way we see who God has called us to be who he has created us to be and who he wants us to be. So we need to look through the lens of the gospel. So go ahead and go to 1 Corinthians. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 this morning. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, just to give you a little bit of background on what's happening here. Now, this is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth because they were having some problems, okay? They were having some issues, and the Apostle Paul heard about it, and he said, i got to write these guys a letter and straighten this mess out, because he was an authority in that day, and if you heard from Paul, he was going to bring about correction if it was needed, and it was definitely needed in the church in Corinth, because these guys were getting into a lot of trouble, getting into a lot of hang-ups and a lot of junk that they didn't need to be involved in. So Paul said, you guys are misunderstanding Scripture, you guys are not understanding the Gospel. And so he writes systematically 
through 1 Corinthians. If you read 1 Corinthians, you'll see he deals with five specific issues that he goes from one issue to the next, systematically dealing with perceptions and issues and problems that the Corinthian church was dealing with. And he's wanting them to see the gospel because every time that he addresses the problem, he always answers it with the gospel. The gospel, the good news about Jesus, the good news that says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The good news that says that it's Jesus who has given us value because he died on the cross for us. The good news of Jesus should be the thing that actually turns us towards God and shows us how good God is in spite of our flaws and our failures. And that's what the Apostle Paul addressed when he would bring out these issues. He would always give them the gospel as the answer to everything. Every single one of these issues. He would talk about the love of God. He would talk about the love that we should have for one another. He talked about all of the things that God would want us to do to bring Him glory that should come out of us naturally because we see things through the lens of the gospel. So let's read um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and let's start in verse 12. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 12. Paul says this, he says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food. God will destroy both one and the other, and the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Now let's stop right there. Obviously, Paul is dealing with sexual immorality in the church because during that time, the people in Corinth were in an area where there was a lot of pagan worship. And a lot of the ways they would worship these pagan gods would be to go to the temple prostitutes, to commit sexual acts in honor and worship of those gods. And it was a very perverted area. It was an area that was driven by flesh, that was driven by perversion. And these people had gotten so accustomed to the perversion of their day that they equated their bodily urges to have sex with the hunger-ish urge that you and I have. They said those are basically the same type of urge. They're the same type of thing, and so therefore they both need to be solved the same way. If I feel like I'm hungry, I'm going to go get a burger. If I have a sexual urge, I need to go find a temple prostitute. That's about the same level that they had equated God's gift of sex and had perverted it and messed it up. Now, that was predominant in the culture, but that thinking had crept into the church. It had crept into the church primarily because the message of Christ was one of freedom and liberty. And it was one of forgiveness, and it was one of grace. And so people were thinking, oh, I'll just go do whatever I want. It's my body. It's no big deal. Jesus died for me, and I know that, and he's forgiven me, and it's all good. I mean, it's all fine. I'm free to do whatever I want. That's why Paul led off here in 1 Corinthians 6 by saying, hey, all things are lawful for me. So he's not wanting them to misinterpret the freedom that's in Christ. He said, but not everything is beneficial. In other words, I'm a free man. I am free from the chains and the bonds of sin. But that doesn't mean that everything I still want to do is smart. That doesn't mean my way is the best way. Instead, I need to see what is God's way. So in verse 14, let's pick that back up. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. So do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? You would say, never, I'd never do that. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. So therefore flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside of the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You are bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. So you see here that the Apostle Paul is basically laying out the gospel here for these people, saying, you were bought and paid for by the precious blood of Jesus, so you don't get to make up the rules because you are not your own anymore. You need to submit to the authority and the headship and the leadership of Jesus Christ. You can't just go out and do whatever you want to because He died for you. No, it's because He died for you when you put on the lens and you put on the glasses that help you to see the gospel. You see how good God is and your intent then should be to want to serve Him and glorify Him with your body. 
And that's what he's saying. He's painting out for them. You've been self-led. And I think this is how people are for the most part. We can either go one of two ways. We can be led by self or we can be led by God. And we can look through the lenses of the gospel. I know that these are terrible drawings, but there's some eyeballs in there and a little nose to help you understand. We can look through the lens of the gospel and go God's way, or we can do what self wants to do. And there's two different paths here, really. And one of them, Jesus said, is wide. And there's a lot of people, okay, that are on this path. There are so many people on this wide path that it's easy. You look at it and you go, man, look at all the people. That's the popular path. But guess where it leads? It leads to bondage. And it leads, Jesus said, ultimately to destruction. He said this path, this wide path that it seems that everybody's on, it looks like it's the easier way to go because it's driven by self. But man, it's going to lead you actually to a place of bondage. But here's the temptation. Here's the the temptation of the self-driven path. Is when you first start on the self-driven path, it seems like everybody on there is just so free, man. It seems like everybody that starts out on that path, look at all these people, they're so free. They can do whatever they want with whoever they want, however they want, and they'll just go to church and they'll get their check mark on Sunday and they'll feel better about themselves. And, and, but then the rest of the week they're going to go do whatever they want. And it's the same thing Paul was dealing with with the church in Corinth. These people were coming and they were assembling in the church and they were coming and they were worshiping God together and then they were going out living like everybody else because their view and their perception was distorted. But they saw it as freedom. It starts off as this view of it's so freeing. But it actually leads to bondage because think about all the things that everyone here is doing. Think about all the things that people on the wide path are doing that's leading to destruction. At first, it seems like fun. At first, it seems like, man, it's no big deal. There's no consequences at all. But the further down that path they get, the more in bondage they get to it. I mean, the first hit's always free, right? (laughs) The first time's always free. It it, it, it feels good, do it. You know, it feels good to spend that money. Next thing you know, you're in bondage to debt because you got addicted to feeling good about spending money. Uh, it, it felt good at first to uh, gossip about that person, and it felt like I was being justified, but now you're ensnared to these relationships that are poison to you, and it's actually hurting you, and it's got you in bondage to these conversations and these relationships with these people. And and all of a sudden, now you're in bondage. But at first, it felt good, man. I thought it was so free. It looked so easy. The party scene, it looked so good. It looked like so much fun. And next thing you know, you become slave to alcohol or you become slave to having to be around other people all the time and being liked. You become a slave to sex or pornography. And at first it seems so free, just like the people in Corinth. But Paul said, man, don't you know that you are not your own? Don't you know you were bought with a price? You see, when I put on the gospel lenses, I see something different. I see a path But man, it's a lot more narrow than this path. And when I look at these two paths, I go, this one at first seems really freeing, and this one at first seems like it actually puts me in some sort of bondage in the beginning. It doesn't seem very fun. And actually, there's not very many people over here hanging out on this one like there is over here. And it seems like bondage, but actually, if you keep walking down that narrow path that may not be as wide, that may not be as popular, you're actually going to end up walking straight to life and freedom. And you know what else? Peace. And you know what else? Joy. And contentment, but that one's too hard to spell. (laughs) When you look here at this illustration, you see that, man, at first it doesn't seem like everyone's having as much fun over here, but actually it brings freedom. I remember an illustration that I heard uh, taught one time 
And uh, it goes like this. There was a group of children that were brought to this university that was going to study behavioral science. And they took this group of children out into a very large field. It was hundreds of acres. And they took the children out in the middle of this field and they had built a small playground in the middle of this large field. And then they left the children there and they said, play. There are no rules, just play. And then the people that were observing them walked away And guess what they observed? The kids stayed right there on the equipment. They didn't go anywhere beside the equipment. Had they left the safety of the equipment, they would have probably gotten lost or been afraid that they were alone or maybe, you know, one or two could convince, you know, another to go on a journey and then they get injured and nobody can hear them, call for them. So because of all those fears, they stayed right there on the playground equipment. Then they removed the children from the playground and built a large fence around the property. And they said to the same group of children, now go play wherever you want, whatever you want to do. They ran and played tag. They, they, some of them played on the equipment, but some of them were running around to the very borders, to the very edge of the fences. And they were having fun because, see, when we look at the big open field, we go, freedom! But then there's all these things that could happen. There's all these things that I actually could get hurt by. There's these feelings of being alone. There's these feelings of being abandoned. There's this feeling of not being safe. But then when I look at the boundaries that are put in place, it's not that someone is stealing your fun. It's not that someone is wanting to take something away from you. It's that someone is actually wanting you to experience true joy and freedom that comes with submitting to authority and boundaries. So when you see things in Scripture that you don't like, that you view as something that you would attribute to bondage, actually, if you submit to God's way, it's going to lead to true freedom, life, joy, peace, contentment. Amen? If you submit to it and you trust, you've got to look through the lens of the Gospel. You've got to trust that God is good because that's really what these glasses do. These glasses show me that God is good. They don't make God good. He's already good no more than my glasses made leaves on the tree. God is already good. I just need to see that He's good. And for me to see that God is good, I need to see through the gospel. And I need to see the value that He's placed on me. And when I want to go do stupid stuff, I remember that I'm not my own. I was bought with a price. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And I need to see things through the lens of the gospel. The one who died for me, the one that purchased me back from bondage with His precious blood. And when I see that, it changes the way that I deal with issues. It changes the way that I may fall into temptation and allow myself to get wrapped up in addiction or things that are going to harm me or harm others in my life. And now I'm seeing things differently because the gospel glasses show me the truth. I see the truth when I put on the lens of the gospel. Show me a person who is addicted and in bondage and all sorts of chains, enslaved to all sorts of things. Guess what? I'll show you somebody who doesn't truly see the gospel the way the gospel truly presents itself. Some people get wrapped up in bondage to religion because they think that if I can outperform someone else and be better than someone else, that that gives me a leg up in the game. And all of a sudden, it's this internal Christian class warfare that does not exist in God's world, but it exists in ours. And we think that we're better because of our tenure. We think we're better because of our performance, what we have, haven't done. And we're getting back over, drifting into this lane of bondage because it makes us feel better about ourselves instead of serving one another, loving one another, which is the road less traveled. It's easy to hold a grudge over here because everybody does it. Eye for an eye, right? That's what everybody's after. I want to see them fail. I want to see them blow up so I can, so I can say, ha ha, told you so. I knew it was coming. And that's what everybody does, man. It seems so freeing. It feels so good. Because over here, man, this road is predominantly dominated by my feelings. It's how I feel. That's really the priority here. It seems so free. It feels so good. And over here, I go, man, that that looks like bondage, so it's not very attractive to me. That's because you're not wearing the right glasses. If you wear the right glasses, you actually see that God actually wants better for you than you want for yourself. But that's a hard thing for someone that doesn't understand the gospel to see because they don't see the fact that God truly values them and loves them because they don't really see the gospel. So if they don't see the gospel, then how can they see the fact that God wants better for them than they want for themselves? 
you're going to hear things throughout your life that are going to conflict with what you've been programmed to think and see. You're going to have different opportunities, let's call them. Opportunities is a good word. In your life to be challenged by things that are true, but yet you want to ignore. Because they're hard. They're hard truths. And sometimes you'll hear some of those hard truths from a sermon. Sometimes you'll hear some of those hard truths from a a loved one. Sometimes you'll hear some of those hard truths from a pastor or from maybe even just the Holy Spirit that's convicting you and wanting to draw you to a place of repentance and brokenness and forgiveness. Or maybe it's a hard truth that you see in Scripture that you're like, whoa, didn't know that was in there. Can we just kind of glaze over that one? There'll be all kinds of opportunities for you to walk away from challenges and difficult things. Because guess what? Sometimes when you hear the truth, Sometimes, man, that's easy to swallow. And sometimes you go, yeah, praise God. Thank you, Jesus, for that truth. And we praise God for it, and it's easy to apply. I've seen people who had all kinds of hang-ups, issues, and addictions and bondages that God instantly set them free from because they put on a different pair of glasses. And it's fantastic when that happens. But it doesn't always happen that way with everybody. Sometimes it takes people longer to unlearn what they've learned. And it takes them longer to see what they're not seeing. And they stay wrapped up in it. And that's when you need people to come alongside you who are willing to hold you accountable, who will talk straight to you in love, who will be able to walk arm in arm with you, hand in hand with you, whether that's your spouse, your pastor, a friend who's a strong believer that, that, that can help you walk through some junk, that can help you go, hey, what you're doing right now is leading you to destruction. It's keeping you in bondage. Don't you really want to be free? Yeah, but I'm free up here. And then initially you feel free and it feels good, but then it starts to not feel good. I know you guys know that I like basketball, and I went to a Bucks preseason game last night, single tear right here, <laughs> something in my eye. And I went to the game last night, and out of all the games that I've been to, um, I've caught some cool stuff, you know, like t-shirts when they throw them out, or, you know, little mini balls. Well, every time that the hoop troop, which is the group that will do the, all the slam dunks where they jump off of the the, um, the little uh, trampolines and stuff and do flips in the air and do the dunks. When they're done with their show, they'll take all the balls that they were dunking and they'll just throw them out in the crowd. It's the craziest thing you've ever seen in your life because they're throwing basketballs that are inflated at people. <laughs> Thousands of people and they're just, boom, just throwing them at people. And you better be paying attention. Well, I got really good seats this year and... I, uh, I knew maybe tonight was the night I could get one of those basketballs, and I told my daughter who was with me last night, I said, I'm going to try to get us one of those basketballs. So when they were done with their show and they were running off the court and they were about to do their thing where they throw these basketballs into the crowd, we got up and we were like, over here, over here, here, pick me, pick me, pick, here, me, 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 yeah, yeah, throw it here, I want it, I want it, I want it, throw it here, throw it here, I want the ball, I want the ball. And the guy just lobbed it right up to me and I caught it and I was like, and I caught the ball and I said look Abby and she's like you caught the ball I caught the ball I put it down and I took a picture of it and I sent it to my wife I said we caught a ball she texted back no way that's awesome we drove home I took the basketball out of the car and I'm like I got the basketball and then I set it on the couch and I was like I can't wait to show the kids when they wake up and when they woke up the next th- this morning. And I said, kids, look, we got a basketball. Oh, that's great. And now there's a basketball on my couch when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to find some place to put it. I have no idea. What am I going to do with all this stuff I've gotten from these basketball games? And now, if I go back to a game and they want to throw basketballs, I'll be like, yeah, I already got one. (laughs) But that's how we do with life. If we're not looking through the lens of the gospel, we get excited about something we think we want, we think we need, we think it's going to make us happy, and we are excited about it when we get it. My life is going to get better when I get married, when I get this promotion, when I get this job, when I get this house. Ooh, pick me, pick me. I want to get in debt. Woo! And then we get it, 
and we're happy about it and we show it to our friends. Look, look at my new this, look at my new that. Oh, it's so great, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so great. And then it's kind of like, okay, now what am I going to do about this? You mean they send bills in the mail after I get the good feelings? That kind of defeats the good feeling thing. Or you wake up and you realize, wow, this person I thought that was going to fix my life and make my life perfect, man, they got problems too. And then what begins to happen is, 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 is because I'm driven by self and I'm not looking through the lens of the gospel, I begin to get off track and get into things that actually I thought were freeing, I thought were exciting, but actually they leave me empty and leave me wanting more. And I don't have a proper definition of contentment, so then what do I do? I go and I look for the next thing to get excited about. I look for the next person, the next job, the next car, the next pat on the back, whatever it is, to make me feel better. Because I'm chasing these things that always leave me empty. But the reason they leave me empty is because they can't really satisfy now, is there anything wrong with having stuff and wanting better stuff and saving your money and planning and buying new stuff? No, absolutely not. But what's your motive? What's your motive for the new car? What's your, is it a wise decision right now? What, what's your motive for the promotion? Is it so people will finally respect you? You see, because if that's the kind of stuff you're after, then once you get it, it'll feel good for a minute but then you'll be empty again and then you'll get discontented with that again. And people look at their marriages that way and that's why people have problems in their marriages and marriages don't last because they look to this person to fix all my problems. I know the answer. We're disconnected. Let's have a baby. That'll fix it. Yes. No. That makes it more challenging. And that's what people do. They look through it, but they're going down this wide road. They're, they think they're free they, based on their feelings. They're just trying to feel good, man. They're looking for escape from the pressures. When over here, this seems too hard. This seems like too much pressure. This seems like it's too constricting at some level because you mean God's telling me what to do and he's telling me that I need to walk away from this situation or this situation or I need to not hang out with these people anymore or I need to start doing things his way. And I start doing that, and I'm like, no, 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 no. I want to drift back over here to this lane. And I get back in the same mess. And we keep going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and forth and back and forth and back. And that's how people live. And that's not God's best. Amen, somebody? You see, because the gospel glasses show me whose I am. The gospel glasses not only show me truth, but they show me who I belong to. You remember what the Apostle Paul said as we just read a moment ago when he was writing to the Corinthians correcting them about their sexual immorality? He said, um, I know you think you can do whatever you want with your body, but your body's not really even yours. Don't you know you were bought with a price? Don't you know your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit? It's actually where the Holy Spirit dwells, so it's kind of his to do with what brings him glory is what the Apostle Paul said. So you think you're in charge, you think you're calling the shots, but really, you're not. Um, because if you do, you're going to get into bondage. But if you want to do things God's way and bring Him glory, you're actually going to find that it leads to freedom. It actually leads to peace. It actually leads to contentment. And really at the root of this whole thing is trusting that God is good and He wants better for you than you want for yourself. And we say amen to that. We say God is good all the time. All the time. God is good and it's cute and it kind of singy songy. But do we believe it? That God is good? Because if we believe God is good, then that means I believe and I trust, which takes faith, that God is good even when it's hard. Even when it's difficult. It's not always easy to wake up and to spend time with the Father and to put Him and His kingdom first. It's not always easy to pray and spend time at the feet of Jesus. It's not always easy to filter my decisions through what does God want instead of what does my feelings say. What do my feelings want? What does my selfish 
agenda want. It's not easy to do that, but if you do that, you'll find freedom and peace and contentment like you've never known. But that takes trust. That takes trust because if you really want to get blunt with it, I think it comes down to a belief when we take off these glasses. We're not looking through the lens of the gospel. That somewhere we think that it's okay for us to hit the road without our glasses on. Because we know better than God. And I think that's probably the most blunt way to say it. Is that we think we know better than God. Now no one probably in this room would dare utter those words. Because we would be like afraid we'd get like hit by lightning or at least a little shock or something. We would be afraid to say that, but the way we live proves we believe that. Because we think we're smarter than God. When I put on the glasses, it's me saying, God, help me see things your way. Help me to have the perception you have. Help me to stay on this road and not drift over into a lane that is not mine. You see, when I see whose I am, then that really reiterates the idea the Apostle Paul was trying to get across that says it's not up to you to decide what's right and what is wrong because you belong to God. It's not that you believe the Bible and all of a sudden the Bible magically becomes true because you believed it. It's that the Bible is true and we choose to believe it. Amen? You see, the Bible has already established truth. God has already established His Word as truth. It's not all of a sudden becoming true no more than the leaves on the trees became leaves when I put my glasses on. They were already there. This is already truth. It's just are you going to choose to believe it because there's going to be people who choose not to believe the truth of God's Word. But does that make it any less true? No. This whole idea in society of I can make my own truth and choose what I want to believe. And that may be true for you, brother, but that's not true for me. That's just your opinion. Well, is the Word of God your opinion or is it absolute? Is it absolute truth that has endured thousands and thousands of years that God has preserved for the very reason that He wants to reveal to His people, His nature, His character, their need for Him and the answer to their need? Or is it just a book of opinion that survived a lot of stuff? You see, if we believe that God's Word is true, and that truly is our foundation, then that means that when things come up that conflict with my value system, with my view, with my perception, somebody's got to give, and it needs to be you and me that we need to look through the Gospel. Because if I truly believe God loves me, if I truly believe that He cares for me, then I see that He values me. And if we could catch a glimpse of the way God values us, it would change the way we live for Him and serve Him. He doesn't want to live, uh, He doesn't want us to live in a way where we feel as we're in some sort of bondage to trying to please Him because He says, you don't have to do that. I already said I love you and I like you and I want you to be a part of my family. <laughs> But then we just don't see that. He said, well, I already sent my son to die for you. Doesn't that tell you how much you're worth? Doesn't that tell you how valuable you are to me? And we don't buy it. No, we don't believe it. Yeah, we say the prayers. We go to the church. We stand up. We sit down. We lift our hands and sing the worship songs. We read the devotions. We do all those things. We listen to the Christian music. But do we really live like we believe we're valued by God? Because to see my value is to truly enable me to live like I'm truly worth. And he says, you were bought with a price. You see, gospel glasses show me value. You've never known real love until you look through the lens of the gospel. Because when I look through the lens of the gospel, all of a sudden I see something I didn't see before. I see the fact that I'm loved like no one else can love. I'm forgiven, I'm free. Man, all these things are a reality, and I don't want to just keep preaching about these things and teaching about these things and people not experiencing them. Amen? Because everybody knows these things up here. Man, we know the one-liners. If you've been in church five minutes, you know that 
Jesus has spoken the truth and, and he knows that the, the truth is going to make you free. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. And we hear these things, we amen these things, we high five these things, and we feel good. We sing, I'm no longer a slave to fear. <laughs> and we sing it, we get emotional, and we tear up, but we still live in bondage. What's the deal? Are we just fooling ourselves? Or is there something at the very core wrong with the way I'm seeing things? I think it comes back to the way we're seeing things. I think it comes back to the fact that we got the wrong glasses on. I'm thankful that I found out I needed glasses because what if I had just went on and said, ah, oh, it's no big deal. He can't read line two, which is one away from line one, which is the one you really need to be able to see because it's gigantic. <laughs> but he can't see two, so well, let's give him a pass. He looks like a nice guy. Would you want me driving your family members around? No, you better have them glasses on. I better see some contacts or something. The only time I don't wear my glasses to church is when I'll like, wear my prescription sunglasses and then I forget to bring my extra glasses. I don't have contacts. People are like, do you have contacts? No, I don't. But you wouldn't want me driving without my glasses on. That'd be dangerous. No more than we need to be walking through life without looking through the lens of the gospel. Because it's dangerous, because it's deceiving ourselves to think we're okay when we're not okay. The test told me I'm not okay. The test showed me I needed to see things differently in order to be safe, in order to really experience driving in the best way possible, just like the lens of the gospel tries to show us in order for us to really enjoy the life God has for us, for us to truly live and walk out this thing that he has for us. Man, we've got to see things differently you see, when I know and I feel the value that Christ alone gives, it not only changes me, but guess what? It changes the way I see other people. Now all of a sudden, through these glasses, I began to see people differently. I began to see, wow, I'm valued and I'm loved, and so are they. And I'm no better than them, regardless of my position in life, regardless of my hang-ups, my struggles, my past, and my failures. Regardless of the things I'm dealing with now, the things I dealt with 20 years ago, the things people say about me, it doesn't matter. We're, 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 we're all the same. This isn't a competition of how can someone out spiritual or out church or out Christian someone else. It's, I go, wow, we all need Jesus the same. But the level of freedom I experience is going to be contingent upon how I see the gospel. And if I see that God's good, it's going to change my value system. Now I don't want to do the things I used to do. Now I want to serve God. It doesn't become a have-to thing. The world looks at it as bondage, but I see it as freedom. The world looks at it as, why would you want to go Sunday to a church? And you look at it, because I get to? Why would you want to waste time reading the Bible? Because I can, and I get to, and it's not wasting time. It's actually feeding and strengthening my faith. Why would you want to waste time praying? I'll, those, those prayers, they never go anywhere anyways except for Pastor Derek's, because he has a bat phone to heaven. <laughs> it's a joke. He doesn't. But people say stuff like, why are you praying? It's words in the air. No, no, no. You see, I get to pray. All of a sudden, my whole idea, my whole perception changes. It doesn't become a have-to thing. If it has become a have-to thing for you, then you need to put on a different set of glasses. <laughs> because, let me tell you, man, if we really understood the weight of the gospel and we understood the great price that Jesus paid for us, it would carve out and shape all of the things that we do and see for ourselves, but also it would carve out the things that we do for others as well. It's love God, love people, serve the world. If I love God, I'm going to love what He loves. That's people. If I love people, I'm going to want to serve them with what? With the love of God that I've been shown. So therefore, I become a conduit of the grace, mercy, love, and truth of Jesus. <laughs> It doesn't come into me so I can tank it up for my own benefit. No, I benefit from it, but it also comes out of me, and that brings God glory instead of me. Because it's like, how could God take somebody like me and use that person? He can and he does every single day. Amen, somebody? So here's the thing. The gospel shows us our need for Jesus, and he shows us our need for repentance. If you've been going down the path of bondage and you've been over here way too long drifting in this lane, that is not your lane. That's not who you are. You don't belong in that lane. You need to get out of that lane. How do I get out of that lane? 
You repent. You repent. That doesn't mean say, I'm sorry, God. That means to turn away from it. That means to be broken over it. God, I want to see myself through the gospel. I want to see myself the way you see me so I can turn away from those things that are leading me further and further down the path of bondage. And I want to step over into the things that may not be the easiest, that may challenge me. But God, if I hear those things and you're speaking those things to me, I'm going to submit to them. You know what I'm talking about. The things that God speaks to your heart on Sunday morning when you're here at church, but then you try to run out the door and try to forget about and get distracted by turning on the radio or talking about the Packer game or talking about where we're going to go eat and you don't want to deal with it, you don't want to think about it. Those are the things I'm talking about. Those things, they will actually bring you freedom if you will submit and deal with them instead of run away from them. You know, every time that you hear a message or you read something or God talks to you about forgiving that person that offended you and you still hold on to it and you haven't let it go, you need to stop running away from it and trying to distract yourself. You need to embrace what God is trying to do in you because it's for your benefit and for His glory. You know those things that you're chasing after that are leaving you empty even though you will get them and they feel good for a minute and you think it's going to last forever and then the feelings don't, don't stay there or you wake up the next morning and those feelings aren't there like they were? Stop chasing those things. You can hear that message and you can let it go in one ear and out the other or you can believe that message and you can say, wow, that's never truly going to bring me joy, contentment, and peace I need to start pursuing what God wants and say, God, what do you want, not what do I want? I want to do things your way, not the way that I want to because I am not my own. I was bought with a price. I love 1 Peter 1 and 18 and 19. We read it last week and hopefully you read it throughout this past week. It says that, don't you know that you weren't redeemed, you weren't bought with things like gold and silver? But you were redeemed, you were purchased by the precious blood of Jesus. Like that lamb without spot or blemish. That perfect sacrifice, that blood of Christ actually redeemed you and made you right in the eyes of God. His sacrifice made you right in the eyes of God. Not nothing you did nor will ever do. But it's all about Jesus and he did it all by himself. And your role now is to trust him and to grow and walk through this journey, trusting Him day in and day out and growing and saying, God, help me see things through the lens of the gospel. Maybe that needs to be your new prayer when you find yourself drifting over into the wrong lane, when you find yourself chasing after another basketball, something that's going to make you feel good, that you want really bad, but then it's just another ball in the house at the end of the day. And it leaves you empty and you want to go chase after another. When you start seeing that you're going in those cycles again, stop. And say, God, help me see myself and see life through the lens of the gospel. Help me to see my value. Help me to see my worth so I can live like my worth. So I can live in a way that will bring you glory and honor, even if it challenges me. Even if it's a hard conversation. Even if it's me opening up my chest to someone that I don't know how they're going to respond. And I need to let them know, hey, this is what's been going on in my heart. This is what I've been dealing with. And you don't have to do this alone. Amen, somebody. That's what church family's for. That's what pastors are for. That's what Christian spouses are for. That's what Christian friends are for. People to help walk with you on this journey. This isn't something that's supposed to condemn you and beat you up over the head. Rather, it's supposed to be something that's actually showing you the way to freedom's over here, folks, is through looking through the lens of the gospel. And when you look through the lens of the gospel, you find that you have peace, you find that it's well with my soul. Have you heard that hymn, it is well with my soul? You know why it's well with my soul? Because I can trust that Christ is enough and that he's given me value. Therefore, guess what I get to do? Rest. Thank you for listening. For more information, please visit wogcc.com.